Are you worried the age pension won't exist when you retire? Turns out you're not alone. More than half of Australians are worried about the pension disappearing. But should we actually be concerned? Here to press the don't panic button for us is Brendan Coates, Household Finances Program Director at Grattan. Welcome, Brendan. Thanks, Kat. So it sounds like a lot of people are worried about their retirement. Should we be worried about the pension disappearing? Yeah, something that comes up a lot in our discussions about retirement income policy and super and some stats that really, really struck me from the retirement income review, which I think we've talked about before, uh, was that some surveys done by the behavioural insights team within the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, they found that less than half of Australians thought the age pension would exist by the time they retired. Uh, and only 37% of people aged under 55 thought it would exist. Um, and so, you know, the majority of people think it's not going to exist. And the same survey found that only 39% of people thought the age pension would have the same value as it does now. And for under 55s, it was one in four. So we've got some really pessimistic expectations out there about what's going to happen to the age pension. But what's really striking is it's really hard to square with you know, the facts that the review and others have put out about what the role of the age pension is in our community, how much it's going to cost, and also the political constituency that's really there to support it going forward. So it's quite a striking disconnect in the public discussion. So, Brendan, is the pension actually sustainable into the future? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I think that's what's really striking is the pension actually is very sustainable. So pension spending, for example, as a share of GDP, is going to fall pretty sharply um, over the course of, you know, the next couple of decades. So, you know, we're going to spend, we're currently spending something like 2.5% of GDP of total income across the economy on the pension. Uh, that's going to fall to 2.3% by 2060. And that really flies in the face at the with the idea that, you know, we've got an ageing population, we're going to see more people um, on the pension for everyone who's of, of working age. And so that what they call the dependency ratio is going to go up and up. And that at some point, the pension is going to become unaffordable. Like that is something that has played out at times in other countries where they have much more, more generous pension systems in Australia. You know, if you look at Greece, when we had the European sovereign debt crisis, part of the big problems there were that you could retire at age 55. Uh, you know, the retirement age in Australia is 67. Uh, so it's a lot higher. The pension is a modest but fairly adequate amount of money provided you're owning your own home. If you don't own your own home, you could be in trouble. But what's really striking is even as the number of working age people falls from, you know, something like four and a bit people for every age pension age person now to, you know, three by 2060, that pension spending is going to fall. And it's going to fall for a couple of reasons. One, you know, it's means tested pension. So the particular design of the pension means that as people have more wealth, um, you know, partly because of super and other savings, then they'll become eligible for less pension but not because you're broke, but because you're well off enough that you sort of exceed the income and asset test thresholds. And also that those thresholds themselves uh, are only indexed to inflation. So as rising as incomes rise, uh, people will become eligible for less pension over time. And so these facts just mean that the pension's gonna be there and it's probably pretty unlikely, I think, to change in its current form. Uh, partly because one, we've already made a bunch of policy changes. You know, we've raised the retirement age from 65 to 67 recently. Um, we've tightened the assets test. But because the political constituency in favour of the pension existing is now pretty strong, you know, the, if you think about two major parties, one major party, our centre-left party, the, the ALP, is probably the party supporting, you know, a larger and more generous social safety net on average. Um, and the other party that you'd think would be more worried about the pension and, and has tended to support smaller safety nets, which is the, the Liberal Party in coalition with the Nationals, happens to be the party that has cornered the vote, vote amongst older, older Australians. And so, you know, the average age of, of the electorate has increased substantially over time. And so because of that, I think it's pretty unlikely that you will see fewer people, a lot of people or a, lot, a government thinking about curtailing the pension substantially because something like 34% of people in the electorate over the age of 55, 38% of enrolled voters. So I do want to ask you about that because isn't like an enthusiastic politician going to come in and, and slash the pension at some point as part of the said budget cuts? I mean, we're in a precarious economic situation at the moment with um, the coronavirus crisis and things like that. Wouldn't it be a good idea to cut this kind of thing? 
So if we think about what's the policy rationale for is the pension sustainable, I think the answer is very clearly yes. Uh, current policy settings is going to cost us less as a share of our incomes going forward than it does now. Um, so that's, you know, if you if a politician got up today and said we need to cut back on the pension because we can't afford it, I think the case for doing so is now incredibly weak. Now, beyond that, a politician might stand up and say, I don't think we should have such a generous income support system for older Australians. We should cut that back. And I think, as we've just been talking about, the electoral consequences of that could be quite dire. Uh, you know, we just had an election about franking credits, which is obviously support that go flows to older Australians, but overwhelmingly higher income older Australians. And that that, you know, the in that election, um, you know, we had the Liberal Party, which, you know, on, on average is probably less fa- focused on the safety net, supporting older Australians and their franking credits, which is probably more their natural constituency. But I think that same logic is probably going to play out when it comes to something like the pension. It's going to be hard for a politician to get up and say we should change it. And if you do, uh, I think you're going to be hit for it. And we saw that when in the Abbott era, when they proposed changing the indexation, the pensions index to wages growth, so it keeps up with living standards. Instead, of the proposal was to index it to, the, to inflation, so it didn't grow over time with living standards, and that ended up being defeated in the parliament. I think too is a very hard PR exercise to manage. You know, taking away money from older people. I think it's it, it just has the opportunity to become a PR nightmare, and I can't see any politician wanting to touch that, um, especially you know close to an election or something like that. What I'd like to know, though, because this all kind of affects people who are close to retirement, and, I mean, you're talking about people who are voters in the electorates now who are either on the pension or close to retirement. What about people in their 20s and 30s? I mean, not a lot of us necessarily think about our pension in our in our 20s, but it certainly will have an effect on us when we retire. Yeah, that's right. And so the, the modelling that Grattan's done, that the Retirement Review did, says that the average Australian is probably going to rely on the pension for roughly half of their retirement income or something close to it. They may only be eligible for a very small amount of age pension the the day they retire, but provided they draw down at least some of their retirement savings, then that pension, the amount of pension they'll be eligible for will grow quite substantially over time. Uh, But if you think back to the modelling we were talking about before, you know, it's 2020, so 26 years, 40 years away, there's a fair chance that you and I are at the point of retiring, if not retired, possibly either way by 2060. It depends how we go in the housing market over the next couple of decades. Um, I don't know how old you are, Brendan, but I'm not giving anything away. <laughs> indeed. I think, um, you know, I think it's a fair point though, that if in our modeling, someone who's 30 today will be 70 in 2060. And so, you know, and therefore at the point where you'd expect a lot of people are, are retired or starting to retire. And so, Going forward, you know, at that point, the pension is expected to be smaller as a share of GDP, as a cost to, on the community than what it is now. Uh, so sustain, it certainly looks like it'll be sustainable. And so the case, I don't see that case, given that most Australians will remain eligible for at least a part rate pension, irrespective of what you do to compulsory super, by the way, uh, the rate of compulsory super, then you'll expect that there'll be broad support for the pension remaining because it will remain an important source of retirement incomes going forward for almost everyone. And I think we'll get into that in a little bit, but I'm really curious that if the pension is so sustainable, why are people really worried about it disappearing? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. The review points to some of the things that they think might have driven it. Um, You know, I think one is this view that superannuation is there to sort of wean people off the pension, that like the idea is to replace the the pension with superannuation. Um, That's certainly something that's kept being, you know, prominent in some rhetoric about the, the, the purpose of super being to supplement or substitute for the age pension. I think when you just look at the maths of how the income and assets test works and the fact that superannuation, even if it rises going forward, the average Australian is clearly not going to be weaned off the pension. That is That trade-off you know, actually w- won't happen to the extent to which I think people might expect. Um, I think there's also a concern that it stems from some of the early intergenerational reports that, you know, we thought the pension was going to be this incredibly expensive bomb that was going to blow up the um, our, pension, our budgetary situation. Now, I think what we've since learned is that, one, because of, because of migration, um, the population has grown faster than we expected. The dependency ratio is lower than we otherwise expected it to be. Uh, two, it's not the pension that's actually the cause of any sort of long-term budgetary challenges. It really is health and aged care. So, yes, you could have a situation where you're worried about health and aged care costs and you look to cut back the pension. 
then I think you're into the debate we had a discussion we had earlier about the political sustainability of that for any party that proposed it. Uh, I also think just the existence now of, you know, a $3 trillion superannuation sector that tends to frame the pension itself as being a failure, that if you haven't achieved um, self-funding, as in the, you are not relying on the pension, even though you might still be generating or relying on substantial super tax breaks, that is seen as being, you know, a failure. And that that framing is, you know, quite prevalent in a lot of the public communications from superannuation funds themselves. You know, it's worth remembering that the number one emotion that people tend to associate with retirement is fear. And so these these concerns, these things that, you know, you might pick up along the way about how sustainable the pension's going to be or what the purpose of super in, they feed into a fear about not having enough in retirement and therefore a concern about not having enough superannuation if superannuation is there to replace the pension. I think that's driven quite a lot of the concern that we need a higher rate of super when in fact, you know, the current rate of super plus the pension, which we don't think is going to go anywhere, probably does its job. So playing devil's advocate, Brendan, I mean, shouldn't we raise super to 12% and then that would enable us to cut the pension or save that money from taxpayers? So that's really interesting because I think there's two parts to where, why you might think that's a good idea. And I think on both of them, it actually turns out not to be. So if we just take it on the fiscal side itself, you know, the review is really clear. If you increase the rate of compulsory super, say to 12% rather than the 9.5% we have today, it costs the budget now to something to the tune of, I think we estimated at $2 billion a year because the money that otherwise would have gone into workers' pockets as wages is instead going into superannuation where it's tax very concessionally. So the government's giving up tax revenue from the get-go. And that remains true even if you thought a lot or all of the increase in compulsory super came from employers' pockets because employers are taxed at a personal tax rate of, at a, sorry, a corporate tax rate of some between, where, between 25 and 30% whereas the tax rate on super contributions is 15%. So irrespective of where it comes from, it's going to hit the budget bottom, the budget bottom line today. But then those superannuation tax concessions, they exceed any pension savings you're going to get until about 2055. You know, and so you do the numbers through, you're talking about something like you know, an extra 2% of GDP in accumulated debt between now and 2055 that gets accumulated that needs to be paid back before you at all end up in front on the age pension savings. So even if you just took the cold-hearted view of the pension and the budget, it costs you far more than it saves. So high super actually exacerbates the budgetary costs of an aging population rather than solving that problem. Uh, the second part of it would be, okay, well, what impact does that have on the other things that we care about? So super provides, you know, the income support system as a whole, the retirement income system, you know, has various parts and they fulfill various functions. So the thing the pension's really there for is to make sure people have a minimum adequate level of income so they're not in poverty. And it, as a result, because it's means tested, it also tends to reduce inequality. So if you replaced super pension, the pension with super, you would have a much more unequal, you know, retirement income, a much more unequal retirement incomes. The distribution of retirement incomes would be much more because super is a contributive system. You get out what you put in. And so if you replace one with the other, more or less, then the average, the amount of income inequality in retirement will go up quite a lot because at the moment the pension's doing a lot to stop that from happening. And without the pension, retirement incomes will be far more unequal amongst over 65s than they are amongst younger Australians. Two of the things that you've said really struck me. I think it's good to take the emotive nature of super out of it and just look at the numbers because it is kind of a lot of it. You're right that it's driven by fear. We're afraid that we won't have enough money in retirement. We won't be able to enjoy strolling down the beach with our dog as the advertising tells us we will be doing. But I really want to know who are the people that the removal of the pension would affect the most? And who are the people who benefit from having the pension there as part of their retirement income? So I should say, first of all, all of those ads of, you know, retirees with silver hair wearing white linen on the beach, you know, white linen is pretty cheap these days. You could probably recreate that even on the pension. So, you know, if you want to have that life, <laughs> you can probably do it. Um, even if you're substantially rely upon the pension as a source of your income support in retirement, of your income in retirement. So, you know, I think it's one of the things that I think there is less appreciated about what super, what the pension does is the role that plays in providing a safety net, in providing certain forms of insurance. So the pension, as we've said before, it's the one source of uh, this, it's part of the system that redistributes income 
uh, from wealthy to low income and therefore reduces inequality. Um, whereas super tends to increase it because of but not just it's a contributory system, but then that's exacerbated by the tax concessions that do flow overwhelmingly to high income earners. Um, this pension is also the one part of our retirement income system that's actually closing the gender gap in retirement incomes because women earn less. You know, they are, I'm sure we either have or will very well will soon do um, podcasts on the gender gap in, in, in wage earnings. Uh, and that's really important. And that feeds through into the gender gap in retirement. So, you know, because women earn less for various reasons, everything from they paid less for the same work through to they have less workforce participation, uh, they get less super and therefore they'll have, there's a gap in their super at retirement, uh, which could lead to a gap in, a big gap in the retirement income, but it's closed quite a lot because the pension redistributes money to women over men because they're lower income. Um, but the group that I think really gets hurt the most if you sort of roll back the pension, well, look, it's it's lower income people, right? So the pension is there as the safety net. Uh, and I don't think it's going to disappear. Uh, but if it did, the group that you would just see such a substantial increase in inequality. But the pension is not just there. And I think this is really important. It's not just there for low income earners. You know, the pension actually is a really important thing for middle income Australia uh, because they're going to rely on it to a degree later in life. But it also provides really important insurance. So we see, saw this during COVID. You know, the stock market fell 30, 40%. Um, that has a big impact on, on people's immediate, you know, their, their immediate um, retirees' immediate uh, living standards, uh, their perceived level of wealth. Uh, one of the things that superannuation, that the pension does though, is that it compensates them. So it's for most people who are on the means test, so they're not on a full pension. So as they earn more or have more assets, they get less pension. And if they have less assets or they earn less, they'll get more pension. And so what we've seen is that even if you, you know, took a whole bunch of money out of your super because of COVID, because of the early release scheme, your retirement income doesn't fall very much because what you lost on super, you largely get back by a higher age pension if you're, you know, across most of the earnings distribution. If you're a very low income earner, then you're already going to be on the full pension. If you're a very high income earner, you're probably never going to get the pension anyway. But everyone in between, the bulk of the population, you've got this insurance. And so that provides really important insurance against those kind of risks, you know, whether it be your returns are lower, there's a global pandemic and you lose your job for three years. Uh, those things, uh, that insurance role is super important, I think really underappreciated. And in fact, when we look at the problems in the retirement income system, like where it's not working, it's largely the role, the, their weaknesses in the income support system in providing that support and providing that insurance. The big ones, if you if you um, are 55 and you become unemployed, job seekers is really, really low. It's low for everyone, but if you, if you lose your job at that age, it's harder to get back into the labor market. You could have a decade where you're on job seeker. Uh, DSP is no, disability support pension is no longer an option for you most of the time because they, we tighten the eligibility rules, which makes it harder if you've got a back problem to get DSP. And the other areas, of course, if you're a renter in retirement, the pension's perfectly adequate, adequate for a retiree who owns their own home, but it's clearly inadequate for pensioners that rent. And so that's probably where we need to focus going forward. Now, Brendan, in wrapping up, I was wondering, what would you say briefly to somebody who's still worried about their pension in old age? I would say the pension's going to exist. Uh, my parents grew up worrying and fretting about the pension up until the moment they started receiving it up until the moment where they became eligible. And I think that's true of a whole bunch of that generation that at the moment where you, you're worried that it's not going to exist until you hit retirement age and it's still there. You know, the pension has been in existence since 1908, I think, or basically since Federation. And I don't think it's going anywhere as a result. The political constituency that supports it uh, remains strong and in fact is getting stronger. Uh, it's the one part of the income support system that generally does not get subject to, uh, you know, more stringent rules about robo debts, about, you know, uh, reciprocal requirements to work, all this sort of stuff. It, the pension is overwhelmingly always um, exempt from those requirements. And there's a reason for that. It's because the political constituency is very broad based and therefore the prospect of it going away is really, really slim. And you know, if you're worried about your retirement income, you should go on the ASIC website and see how well you're doing. And if you plug in your income and your assets and what you've got, and it says you're going to have something like 65 to 70% of what you're earning right now after tax, then you're doing exactly what you should be doing.
Thanks, Brendan. That is good advice. Um, in short, don't panic. I'd just like to thank you so much, Brendan, for coming on the podcast today. And I really appreciate your insight into retirement incomes. I'm sure we'll have you on sooner or later uh, to talk more about superannuation, to talk more about all your areas of interest this year. If you've enjoyed this podcast or want to connect with us on social media, please find us at Grattan Inst on Twitter and Grattan Institute on social media. Thanks so much for watching.